Batteries. Which one to pick? Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. The batteries form one of the most expensive components in electric propulsion. But this is not because of their complexity. With batteries, you simply need a lot of them. And that can become a serious challenge when you're considering things like space and weight. Since the batteries are also very heavy, weight is a bad thing for ships. So today I'm going to review the common choices for battery chemistries, the pros and cons to each one, and suggest some general strategies to help you decide whether you should invest in the expensive batteries or go for bargain basement. Before we get into this, I want to give an acknowledgement and thanks to Jeff Cote from Pacific Yacht Systems. He provided a lot of the background information that I use to create these presentations. Uh, if you're interested, I highly recommend that you check out his website and his YouTube channel. And just a quick disclaimer, I'm not an electrical engineer by trade, I'm a naval architect, which means that I know many of the details of electric systems, but not all of the finer points. So take my advice as a starting point, but always hire an expert to give you the final solution. When selecting batteries, your first step is to start by considering the chemistry. Which type of battery do you want? There isn't just one clear winner. You have to consider the battery capacity, the depth of discharge. That's another way of saying the usable capacity of your battery. Think about the weight. Think about the volume, the, the space that you need for storing this battery. And uh, the lifetime charging cycles. How often are you going to have to replace this battery? And although I left it for last, the biggest item for all of us, cost. And like me, you probably go out to the internet asking for some general advice first to get an idea of how things go. And you probably see a figure like the one on your screen right now. Little charts that compare the different battery chemistries. But did you notice the little asterisk on that chart that said, based on bare cell? These numbers come from a test battery, something that is only ever used in a lab. This doesn't consider the weight of the casing, the spacing of multiple cells, or any included electronics that are protecting that battery. And more importantly, it ignores cost. So it's a pretty graph, but is it actually realistic? Myself, I like to compare real world batteries as they are shown in their final state, ready to be sold. This offers a somewhat skewed perspective because I'm only comparing individual manufacturers. There's no guarantee that I've picked the best manufacturer in each category. But it still provides an excellent overview to decide which battery chemistry you want to look into with further scrutiny. So now let's look at the figure on your screen. This is the comparison of weight and volume but it's based on real world batteries. I got these straight off of listing sites that were selling batteries. We can see that these batteries largely segregate into three categories. Lead acid and AGM batteries, they form the entry level. There's nothing impressive from a weight or volume perspective. On the other side, we have lithium iron phosphate batteries. These stand out as the clear winner. They're your high performance option. They are way less and they require less volume. And then a little less known is the carbon foam battery that stands sort of in its own category. It doesn't win any prizes for weight with a similar specific energy to lead acid. It weighs about the same, but it leads the pack in terms of volumetric density. Carbon foam packs the energy into a small space requiring even less volume than lithium iron phosphate. That doesn't make it a good choice for a racing boat, which needs to minimize the weight. But if you have a cruising boat and just need to fit lots of battery into a small space, well then carbon foam offers a pretty good option. And the moral behind this is that any of these are good options. So which battery works for you? your lifestyle is going to determine the best battery chemistry that you want to pick. And by lifestyle, I actually mean your wallet. Money! It's no secret that cost factors largely into your purchase decisions. Very understandable. Better performance means higher cost. 
So sure, we all want to go to the lithium because they're amazing. But how much do we pay for those fancy lightweight batteries? Well, now the figure on your screen is comparing cost against specific weight. And this is really interesting because we're combining the weight energy supplied, the weight of the battery, and the cost for purchase into one single comparison. And in this comparison, lithium only costs about 20% more than AGM batteries. Now remember, we're thinking about this in terms of dollars per kilowatt hour per kilogram. So it's how much do you have to pay to get something that's good at packing energy into a little amount of weight. And in this comparison, the lithium battery only costs about 20% more than AGM batteries. Well, the actual prices on the shelves are a lot more than 20% over AGM. So the lesson behind here is that yes, you pay more for lithium batteries, but you get more as well. The extra cost is largely matched by the extra value. Switching over to the carbon foam batteries, we again see that they're not winning on a weight basis. So now we see where things stand on value, but there's more to a battery than just weight. We also care about the power that they deliver. I mean, come on, we're not buying these to make expensive paperweights. Their whole purpose is to store power as a chemical energy. Is the cost justified for achieving that function? With large investments like these batteries, we especially need to ensure that we get good value for our money. We want those batteries to be good at storing electricity, and they have to do it for a reasonable price. So now I've compared the purchase price against the energy stored in the battery. And I'm basing this on usable energy, accounting for depth of discharge. Here things get really interesting. The value sways heavily based on two major factors. Number one, the depth of discharge. To maintain battery life, you shouldn't be discharging a battery completely all the way to zero before you recharge it. So the depth of discharge sets the usable capacity of your battery. Then number two is the total lifetime cycles. How many times can you recharge this battery before it more or less stops working? The answer shows that there's a strong relationship between these two factors and it leads to many complicated graphs and tables and a lot of debate on what the end of life is. So I'm keeping things way simpler by selecting the best values from each category and creating a best case comparison. Even though I simplified everything down and ignored all that complexity, there's still a problem. The best value depends on how you use your battery. So there are two graphs on your screen right now and they show two different cost comparisons. The short-term cost, that compares the purchase price against the usable energy from a single charge of the battery. On the other hand, the long-term cost compares against the total energy stored in the battery across the lifetime of all recharge cycles. And they have very different stories to tell. In the long-term, lithium iron phosphate batteries are absolutely trouncing lead acid. Yes, lithium extracts a heavy price, but it may be the last battery that you will ever buy. That's a great thing to think about. And carbon foam batteries fall in pretty close to lithium. You get a little bit less performance, but less cost as well. Here's the catch. These high costs only make sense if you plan to use the full life of the battery. It's an investment and you need to use it for its life to get your investment back. That takes time. Even with daily use, a lithium battery is going to last around 16 years. Do you plan to use your boat that long? The average weekend sailor barely uses their battery at all. They fall more into that short-term comparison. And on the short-term, lead acid devastates lithium and carbon foam. Simple and cheap is the way to go when you're only looking at short-term usage. Sure, it doesn't win any performance competitions, but you never needed performance if you're a weekend boater. So performance or bargain basement? Well, the best value for your battery chemistry depends on the lifetime of usage. How do you plan to use these batteries and how long will you own them? You heard me use the words lithium and lithium iron phosphate interchangeably just a second ago. They're not interchangeable. 
Within the category of lithium ion batteries, there are several different chemistries for how to make that battery. That gives you more choices, and when you're trying to pack all this power in for propulsion, you might be tempted to go to the exotic chemistries, get the one that has the most power packed in. That's not lithium iron phosphate. And there's a very good reason that we don't do that. The chemistry that's favored by the recreational market is lithium iron phosphate. And we like this for a safety reason. This chemistry does not suffer from thermal runaway as easily as other batteries. <laughs> thermal runaway. That's a nice way to say that if your battery gets too hot, it can ignite, it can burn a hole through your boat, it can explode! Battery go poof! Yeah, that's a bad thing. More technically, all the lithium battery chemistries, they have a critical temperature where they start to break down, and that releases oxygen, generating extensive amounts of heat. This is basically a fire. Thermal runaway happens when this starts in one cell of your battery, and then the heat from that raises the temperature high enough to kick off the next cell, and then the next, and the next, and the next, until the entire battery is one hot ball of flame and fiery death. Again, a bad thing. With lithium iron phosphate, this is extremely difficult for it to happen. Now certainly, lithium iron phosphate still heats, and it can vent profusely if it's used improperly. That's why there are safeguards built into the battery to prevent that. But even if you do something profoundly stupid, like bypassing all of those safeguards, most of the time, the lithium iron phosphate's just going to produce lots of smoke. By design, the heat from a single cell should not raise the temperature high enough to ignite the neighboring cells. It takes a pretty high temperature with lithium iron phosphate. There is one major exception to this, and that's a puncture of the battery. Some type of physical damage that creates a new conductor between the cells in the battery that will allow rapid current flow. So if you just take a giant iron spike and stab it right into your battery, that could create thermal runaway. But I'm going to place that as a pretty low risk. Ask yourself, what scenario results in a physical puncture to the protected battery on your boat? How many of those scenarios don't start with something else incredibly bad already happening to your boat? For all but a few unlikely events, thermal runaway doesn't happen with lithium iron phosphate batteries. And this is the safety by design that we want out of them. So when you're shopping for marine lithium batteries, lithium iron phosphate is the only safe choice. Okay, let's wrap things up. Going electric, it grants you a lot of options and dozens of decisions. But to control this chaos, it comes down to making a few key decisions first. Number one, pick your system voltage. Number two is pick your battery. Now the exact chemistry is going to depend on your lifestyle. These key questions can very quickly filter the choices and ease the workload of designing your electric system. So just take it one stage at a time and don't be afraid to change your mind. You've got this. You, you need an edge, something to help your ship do more. DMS focuses on engineering solutions that will enable a small business to differentiate itself. So check out the website and learn how we can make your ship stand out from the crowd. Let's do something amazing. Thanks very much.